So let me ask you a question. How often are you aware that you're being tempted? Has there been a time in the last week that you've been tempted? I don't know about you, there's times in my mind where something's happening and I say to myself, I'm being tempted. I acknowledge, I'm aware, I'm actually facing a temptation right now. I mean, that happens on a weekly, maybe daily basis. I would say to myself, daily, I'm facing temptations. And so what I want to talk about today is understanding and escaping temptation. I think it's such a major part of the Christian life that is something that should be brought up and discussed. And if you could turn to 1 Corinthians 10, I'm going to take one verse, verse 13, and talk about it. Paul, I believe, wrote this to comfort the church at Corinth. Earlier on in chapter 10, he had just given an example of 23,000 people that died from sexual sin. They gave in to temptation. And it cost them their life. And so here Paul, he's comforting, I believe, those at Corinth. And so let's read 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, He will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. I believe there's promises that we're going to look at in this text that if you can lay hold of as a believer, it will greatly help you in times of temptation. So that's my purpose, to work through this text, to show you, look at these promises, that that would encourage you in the midst of temptation. So, I want to pick this verse apart. First, the first word is what? No. What's no? It's an absolute negative. In this case, what's he saying no to? He's saying no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. So whatever we get into that he's talking about, he's saying no, no, there's an absolute, none of it. No temptation has overtaken you that you won't have a way of escape. The next word is what? Temptation. What is temptation? We kind of hear the word and we kind of think, I know what that is. But I want to look more in depth at what is temptation. That we can know more what he's talking about here. The Greek word used for temptation is also used for test and trial. If you look it up, there's many places rather than the word temptation, the word test is used. Many places the word trial is used. It's the same word. But you think, well, wait a minute. Temptation and test, but it's not like they're the same thing. How do I differentiate between one or the other? So what is the difference between test and temptation? The example I heard from a brother that helped me get my mind around it was the difference is the difference is between taking a test and being tempted to cheat on a test. So in the midst of taking a test, you may have temptation to now cheat on the test. So temptation comes in in the midst of a test. You're being tested. Temptation comes during a test. Temptation, you could say it's to be enticed by a sinful way to avoid suffering. You want out of some suffering. You want to cheat. That's the easy way to pass the test, people think. The devil tempted Christ to turn the stones into bread in order to avoid physical suffering of the 40-day fast. Christ was in a test, and in the test, there was temptation to turn the stones into into bread, to alleviate the physical suffering that he was facing. So he's tested. Temptation comes upon him in the midst of this test. Now, one thing to realize is temptation in itself is not a sin. Christ, Hebrews 4.15 said, was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. So temptation is not sin. 
Now it can lead to sin. If you are taking a test and you feel tempted to cheat on the test and you do cheat, then you sin. It was wrong. But the temptation is not sin in itself. So what does temptation do? It appears to offer pleasure. It appears to offer an easy way out. It appears to be the best option. You know, rather than study on the test, some people in high school, they cheat on the test. They think that's the best option. The thing is, God, God knows you're cheating. You're going to be found out in the end when He discloses the motives of your heart on Judgment Day. If you cheat, it relieves some of the hard work. It relieves you having to endure through the test. Temptation says, well, this is the easy way. If I give in, it's easy, right? Jesus said in Matthew 7.13, the way is easy that leads to destruction. And many there be that go by it. Most men don't endure under temptation by the help of God, but rather they give in to temptation. They think it's the easy way, but it's not. So, from my present understanding, I'm putting forward, temptation is that which comes while you are in a test, to see whether you will cheat on it or not, or whether you will endure in the struggle and pass the test. You've got to ask the question, where does temptation come from? What's the source? Is it the devil? Or is it God? I put forward, the Bible teaches that God lets you be tempted. But God is not tempting you, but rather uses the devil as the immediate instrument for the tempting and testing. We know from James 1, verse 13, that God does not personally tempt anyone. It says there, God cannot be tempted with evil, and He Himself tempts no one. God doesn't tempt, but He does allow us to be put on trial. He allows us to be tested. In 1 Corinthians 10.13, we even have the answer here. If you look at the text, Read the part, it says, He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. Take out the word not. What does it say? He will let you be tempted. God lets you be tempted. We see that in Matthew 4.1. Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The temptation was not by God. It was by the devil. But he was led into the wilderness by the Spirit to be tempted by the devil. We see in Matt 4.3, the devil is called the tempter. 1 Thessalonians 3.5, the tempter had tempted you. Who's tempting you? The tempter. The devil. It's not God. God doesn't tempt, but He allows you to be put on trial. In Matthew 6.13, in the Lord's Prayer, it prays, Lord, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Why am I, why is this praying, Lord, lead us not into evil? It doesn't say, or lead us not into temptation. I'm sorry, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Why am I praying, lead us not into temptation, if God's not the source of it? As I thought about that verse, this is how I could come to it. He's praying in the midst of the test today, lead us not into being tempted to cheat. Lord, I'm taking a test. Please don't let me be tempted. Don't let me give in as You test me. The devil is the immediate instrument in the midst of our temptations and trials. Now, God does not put evil thoughts in your mind. He does not create an object of temptation to place in our way. But He allows it to be placed there by others. That seems to sound uncomfortable. But I believe that's what we see in the Scripture. In Job 1.12, you see God did not allow Satan to tempt Job through physical suffering initially. He said there, only against him do not stretch out your hand. But then guess what? God gives a little more leniency. In Job 2.6, God allowed the physical suffering. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand. Only spare his life. So the Lord is allowing Job to be put on trial. But God Himself is not the one tempting 
Job. This, this should encourage us, and we'll talk about why. Why does it matter to look at where does temptation come from? In Proverbs 17.3, it says, The Lord tests hearts. We see that God is testing a man's heart. So how does He try us? If He tests us, if He tries us, how does He do that? Exodus 16.4, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in My law or not. 2 Chronicles 32.31, God left Hezekiah to Himself in order to test him to know all that was in his heart. So, it seems to sound wrong to say that God leads us into temptation. Yet the Bible talks that way. Remember, Temptation is not sin. It's not God leading us into sin. Because temptation isn't sin. He's not leading us into sin. He's rather leading us into testing, which testing is actually a good thing for the believer. When you think of taking a test, it shouldn't be, man, I don't want to take it. That's a negative. If we sin, it's our fault. It's not God's. In James 1.4, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. The only reason the temptation may tempt us is because of misplaced desires in our own hearts. Example, you don't desire physical suffering. You're in a trial. Yeah, I am going to turn the stones into bread because I want out. I don't want to endure. I can't take it. That's your desire to not endure, so you take the way out. That desire was in your heart. It's your decision. The fault's on you. God didn't cause you to sin. You sinned. You chose it. Example, we don't want, if you don't desire purity as a single person, then you'll satisfy your lust to, lust to relieve yourself. Or, you can endure and take the way of escape and not sin. This should not make you scared or make you think of God is not on your side, believer. Knowing that God is the source of temptation should not make you think, man, God's not on my side. The coach leads his football players into some intense drills. Why? To do them good in the end for game day. It's not a bad thing. They want the drills. It makes them tougher. It makes them more like Christ. Is a test a good or a bad thing? It's good for the believer. James 1.3 says, "...the testing of your faith produces steadfastness." Who in here doesn't want steadfastness? We all do. And the testing of our faith produces that. Testing is good. It has results. 1 Peter 1, 6-7 In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory. The testiness of your faith results in praise and glory. Who doesn't want that? If you're a believer, you do. In Deuteronomy 8.16, it says He humbled you and tested you to do you bad in the end? Nope. To do you good in the end. God's on our side. Doesn't Romans 8.28 say all things work together for good for those who love God? The sin doesn't work for good. Giving into temptation doesn't at all. But being tested does. You know, you think of a college student. He wants to take the test because he wants to graduate. He doesn't want to keep avoiding the test. He doesn't want to stay where he's at. He doesn't keep trying to postpone it. He takes the test. He endures through it. He passes it. He gets his degree. He moves on. Same thing for the Christian. Come on, let's, let, me, let me be tested here. And if you think that's a bad mindset, David prayed for a test. In Psalms 139.23, he said, Search my heart, O God. Try me. Test me. Prove me, Lord. And see if there's any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. That was David's mindset. What a bold prayer. Lord, try me. But beware that you may be tempted to cheat while taking the test. Beware of that. 
If you look at 1 Corinthians 7.5, it says Satan may tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Tempt you why? Lack of self-control. The devil tempted Christ with physical need at the end of his 40-day fast. Say, command these stones to become loaves. There's a temptation there. But Christ always took the way out. He never knew sin. He never failed. Never failed in his mind. Never failed in his walk. Never failed in anything. He was totally perfect. The devil also tempted Christ to throw himself down from the temple to presume upon God's care. Trying to tempt God to force Him to perform, to protect. Some people do that. They're tempting. They're testing God. Presuming, well, you know, the Lord, I'm already forgiven. I can just go do what I want. So I'm talking about how a test is good. It's not bad. And Christ was tested in the garden. He was tempted to let suffering pass. In Matthew 26, 39, He said, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from Me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as You will. Lord, not My will, Yours. Not My selfish pursuit, but Lord, Your will. That's the heart of the Christian. And if we don't have that in the midst of a test, we'll probably cheat. And we'll fail the test. And it won't strengthen us in the end. We're almost done looking at just that word temptation. So, like I said, in the original language, temptation and test, same thing. I personally view there's a difference. And the difference is in the midst of a test, you're tempted to cheat. So you're taking a test. Temptation comes to not do it God's way, but to cheat on the test and get out of it. And that's sin if you give in to that. Now, for the false professor, tests are bad. For the true Christian, a test is not a negative. But for the false believer, it is. In Luke 8.13, we see some in the time of temptation and testing, they fall away. So the time of testing proves they're false. The time of testing for the believer proves they're genuine. They're put in the fire. They make it out. They make it out more purified than they were before they were put in the fire. A test shows what's in your heart. As, as I read in Second Chronicles, to test him and to know all that was in his heart. The, the Lord tests you to see if you're obedient or not. Hebrews 11.17 Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. Abraham was tested. And in the midst of the testing, he was obedient and he offered up his son. He did not do it. He did it. He was obedient. He took the way of escape. Remember, a test that you don't give in to the temptation in and don't sin will only strengthen you in the end. It's just going to make you stronger. It's going to help you be more like Christ. So, a summary of what I'm trying to get across right now is where does temptation come from? And my present understanding is God leads us into temptation, not sin, in which the devil is the immediate instrument as in God allows the devil to test and tempt us. The Lord does this for our good that our faith may be proven genuine, resulting in glory, as is said in 1 Peter. So it's not a negative. So how does it help to know that temptation comes from God? How does it help? Why would it matter that I should look at my Bible and see, well, the Spirit led Christ into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil? How does that help me to know that? You know how that helped me? It tells me this. God is not only giving us the test, but He's giving us the answers to the test. So the same test giver promises, I'm going to give you the answers. As 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, as we're going to look at, He promises you're going to be able to endure it. There's going to be a way out. So that encourages me. If God's involved in it, and God also promises a way of escape, then I have no reason to be discouraged. I have no reason in the midst of any test to think, oh, this is impossible. I can't get out of it. Because I know God's allowed it to happen. That encourages me. He knows how and in what manner to deliver His people out of temptations. 
So let's look at the verse. 1 Corinthians 10.13 We've talked about no temptation. And the next words are, has overtaken you that is not common to man. You hear the word overtaken you a simpler way that I felt the text is saying is no temptation that attempts to hold you down. No temptation that has been offered to you. So no temptation that attempts to hold you down is not common to man. So what's he saying there? Why is he saying this? What, how does this help us? Well, it's not common. Meaning, nothing you face as a Christian is too advanced. It's not unique. It's not, some trials are unique. But it's not so unique that God's not able to deliver you. Don't let the devil tell you that you've got a unique case and the temptation you face is harder than anything and you just can't get out. Don't let Satan tell you that. That's not true. Because look what he says here. No temptation is overtaking you that is not common to man. Common. If you told me I had to take a calculus test, I would be intimidated because it's not common to me. I don't know calculus. I can't take a calculus test. And here Paul's saying all these tests and temptations you have are common. They're not out of the ordinary. He's saying there's no reason to panic. There's no reason to fear. In the midst of that temptation, you don't need to fall into despair. First Peter 4.12 even says, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. It's not strange. Don't be surprised. The devil wants you to think that. The devil wants you to collapse when you're tempted. The devil wants you to think there's just no way out of this. This is impossible. And Paul's saying, no, it's it's common to man. It is common. It's not out of ordinary. It's not unique. Another thing to comfort the believer, we see in Luke 4.13 that after the devil tempted Christ, he left him and he waited for a more opportune time. So don't be shocked when the devil tries to tempt you in the most opportune time. That really helps me. There's times in my life where I I kind of expect I'm probably going to be tempted right now because it seems like such an opportune time. And knowing that the devil left Christ and waited for a more opportune time, that helps me. Because you're sitting at the table, the milk falls down, tempted to get it frustrated. Baby starts crying, Whatever table breaks, who knows, something crazy happens and you can sit there and think, you know what, this is a pretty good opportune time to me to get tested to see if I'll sin, to see if I'll get anxious, to see if I'll get harsh. So knowing that the devil, while we're on this earth, he's waiting for an opportune time. Know that. That helps me. I'm not shocked when the bullets come flying, spiritually speaking, at the prime opportunity. So let's look at the next words. What does he say here? No temptation is overtaking you that is not common to man. God is faithful. You know, some math softwares claim they can solve every math problem you give them. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But I do know what's true. When God says He's faithful, that really is true. When God says He's true, When God says, no temptation is overtaking you that is not common to man, God is faithful and will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with temptation will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. When He says that, He means it. It's a guarantee. You can bank on it. In the Lord, there's always a way out. There's no excuses for sin. God's faithful. That's the one person you want faithful. God's not corrupt. He's true. But if you look at yourself... If you rely on your own strength, you'll fall. The verse right before, look at verse 12 even. Paul says, Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. If you think you stand, in your mind you think, I can do this. I'm able. Not saying I'm able to do it by the the strength of the Lord, but thinking in my own power, in my own strength, I'm able. Paul's saying, look, if you think like that, you're going to fall. So, God is faithful. We're going to look more at that, but let's look at the next phrase. 
God is faithful and He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. There's times someone asks you to do a job and you say, I don't have the ability. If you ask me to make a space shuttle, I'll tell you, I don't have the ability. Yet look what the Lord says. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. So He's saying no temptation will be beyond your ability to escape. Again, this idea, it's common. It's not crazy. It's not out of the ordinary. It's not something too impossible. The weightlifter, if someone said you may get 10,000 pounds to lift, he'd be intimidated. But he, the Lord will only let you get to a max point. He's not going to go beyond that point. He knows what you can take, and He promises you, I'm not going to go beyond that. You're not going to have some trial that's impossible to endure in. And the things we today may think, well, I couldn't get burnt alive at a stake. Well, granted, thinking about it now, I couldn't. But when I'm put in that situation, if I was, I can believe this verse. That God, you know what? God's not saying it's impossible. You know, the Lord promises in Deuteronomy 33.25, As your days, so shall your strength be. As many days as I give you, I'm going to give you strength for those days. Every day you have, I'm going to give you strength. As your days are, so shall the strength be. As temptation comes, so shall the way of escape be. So no question on the test is too advanced for you to answer it. Let's keep looking at the verse. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, the enticement to cheat on the test, He will also provide the way of escape. It says He'll also provide the way of escape. Do you believe that? You have to believe it. If you don't believe it, it won't work. And you know one compelling argument that helped me really believe this verse? It says in Matthew 23-33, Christ said, You serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? How does that help me? It helps me because this. If God has provided a way of escape from hell, How could He not provide a way of escape from temptation? If He's done the greater, provided a way to escape from the infinite wrath of God for all of an eternity through the sacrifice of His Son, Jesus Christ, and His spilled blood on Calvary, taking our penalty, taking our punishment, if I can believe that, how can I not believe this verse that says He'll also provide a way of escape? If I've escaped the wrath of God, what is a tiny temptation compared to the infinite wrath of God. Do you you see that? That should encourage us. Believe the greater. Save from the wrath of God. Then how can I not believe the lesser? To have a way of escape from temptation. What are some practical ways to escape from temptation? The verse says, He'll also provide the way of escape. That doesn't mean you're sitting there and some door opens up and you walk out of the temptation. Man has his responsibility. In 1 Corinthians 10.14, the very next verse, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. So just like Joseph fled from Potiphar's wife in the moment of temptation, you've got to flee. Whether it's physical, whether it's mental in your mind, you've got to flee. As I mentioned earlier, verse 12 in this passage gives an answer. A way to avoid giving in is to not think highly of yourself. Don't be proud. A big way to overcome temptation is like Christ did. He said it's written. It's written. It's written. He used the Word. And even there the devil in Matthew 4 used the Word. Yet Christ used the Word to destroy the devil's wrong context. So in 1 John 2.14, Young men, because you are strong and the Word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. And the Word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. In our Lord's temptations, He countered each with a Bible truth. He applied the appropriate Scripture to the situation. The main weapon in overcoming temptation is the Word of God. Because in the Word of God, we've got truth. 
and temptation comes along and it tells you a lie. And you have to know your Bible to take a truth from the Word to destroy the lie. Because if the devil says to you, hey, this is what God thinks, and you don't know the truth about what God thinks in that area, then you're going to believe the devil. But if you know, wait, the devil's twisting a verse, this verse over here says that, then you can take the Word of God and you can destroy the lie. And you can think on the truth and escape. You know, in Genesis 3-4, the serpent said to Eve, you shall not surely die. What did God just told Eve? If you eat of it, you will. If you know the Word, that if I eat, I will, then when the devil says, you sure, you're surely not going to die, you can say, no, God said I will. So I'm not going to give in to the temptation. Another way to escape temptation is by worshiping God and not doubting Him. In Job 1.20, after Job had this incredible test that we just saw earlier on, God allowed it to happen and used the devil to tempt him. God didn't tempt him. The devil did. But God allowed for the trial to happen. And look what Job... He, Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head. He fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord is taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Job took the way of escape. He worshiped God. He believed everything I had, God gave anyway, so it's God's right to take it away if He wants. But if you believe the things you have are because of you, then when God takes it away, you're not going to be able to worship God. You're going to say, Lord, I worked so hard to do all that. Why are you taking my stuff away? But his mindset, knowing it's all from God, he was able to worship the Lord right there. Another way to escape temptation is to watch and pray. Matthew 6, 26, 41, the Lord said, Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. I mean, if you know you're walking on rocky ground, you want to watch out. In case you step on a rock, roll your ankle. You want to be careful. You want to be weary. But you want to be looking to the Lord in the midst of it. Another big thing with escaping temptation is not what you do when temptation comes, but it's what are you doing before temptation comes. What are you doing before you're even tempted to begin? Are you living a lifestyle of watching and praying before temptation comes? Not, well, temptations come, now I need to finally get to my praying. No. No. I could be tempted today. I could sin today. And I don't want to sin. I don't want to grieve the Lord. So now I am going to live a life of prayer. I am going to live a life. Even as we saw Paul in the chapter before in verse 27, he said, I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be, should be disqualified. Don't cheat on the test. Look at the life Paul lived before temptation comes. Are you living that lifestyle? That's really important. Because I think that the tendency is you're getting tempted and then now you're like, well, this is the time to run to Christ. Well, I hope that's not the tendency. I shouldn't have said that. But that could be something you could fall into. Let's just live the life how I want to live. Then when temptation comes, then I'll seek God. That's not the true Christian. The true Christian is living a life of seeking God so that when temptation comes, it's all the more easier to not give in to it Because you've been satisfied in Christ. You've been looking to Him. And so you're like, no thank you, Satan. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to suffer for righteousness' sake. So, let's look at the next part. We've looked at already that no temptation that attempts to hold you down is too strong. God is faithful. He'll not let you be tested on too advanced of a level. But with the temptation that comes during the test, He'll provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. That you may be able to endure it. To endure, it just means to undergo hardship. So rather than cheating and getting out, you undergo it. You endure. It doesn't mean there's this instant door where you hop out. There's some fiery darts being thrown. And you're putting your shield. You're you're defending with truth. But that may go on for an hour. God doesn't promise it's just going to be a minute long. Jesus said those who endure to the end will be saved. 
We've got to endure as good soldiers through trials, through sufferings, through temptations. We've got to endure to the end. To undergo something is to be subject to something unpleasant or painful. Yet, we're promised in this verse that we can do that without sin. And remember, Christ, who can sympathize with us in our weaknesses, He was tempted like we were in every respect. And He never sinned. He never gave in. He was perfect. In Matthew 26, 39, again, you see the Lord saying, as you will. That's always got to be what's on our lips. Lord, Your will, not mine. I found this encouraging. In Matthew 4, when Christ's temptations ended, verse 11 says, angels came and were ministering to Him. It's just like the runner who finishes the race and has the water at the end. Don't grow weary when being tempted. When Christ's temptations ended, even though the devil went and waited for a more opportune time, the angels came, they were ministering to Him. Just run. Run a little faster. Run a little harder. Don't give up. Get to the end of that temptation that you're facing and you're going to get ministered to. The Lord's not going to leave you out to dry. So what are promises? What promises are true from 1 Corinthians 10:13? One that's encouraging is no temptation is too advanced or too complicated. Meaning when you're taking the test, don't go into it fearing thinking, you know what? What if there's this problem that's 10 grade levels above me? What if there's this problem that's just so advanced and I, I, I won't be able to answer it? I won't be able to do it. The verse is saying that's not going to happen. God's faithful. He'll help you. Any test question you get, He's going to give you a way out. You don't have to cheat. You don't have to not do it God's way. You can undergo it. You can suffer through it. You can endure. God is faithful. So that's one thing that encouraged me. Another is this. God will be faithful to not let you be tempted beyond your ability. I mean, it's very similar to the first. It's not going to be too complicated. But just to think, it's, I'm not going to face something beyond my ability. Now granted, I can't do anything apart from Christ. You see, in 2 Corinthians 1, Paul said he felt like he received a sentence of death. Paul said, I despair of life itself. And you know what he said after that? He said, but this happened. There's a reason behind it. It happened so I would no longer rely on myself. It happened that I would rely on the God who raises the dead. And so these things, they should lead us to rely on God who raises the dead. They shouldn't lead us to self-reliance. They shouldn't lead us to think I can stand in my own strength. They should lead us to say, Lord, I need You. I'm watching and praying. I'm looking to You. You've got to help me. You've promised in 1 Corinthians 10.13 that You can give me the strength to endure this. That I don't have to give in. That I don't have to say, well, there wasn't a way out. You know, I had no other options. You know, some people sadly say it. They say, well, I'm a single guy. So I had no other options but to give in to lust. That's not true. That's a lie. There is an option. Don't give in. Take the way of escape. Don't blame your circumstances. Don't blame, well, I'm single. Well, I'm this. Well, I'm that. Well, God is powerful. And God is able. And God provides the strength. So what truths do these promises teach us? If God always provides a way of escape, then guess what happens if you don't take it? Whose fault is that? It's yours. This verse teaches anytime you sin, faults on you. You've got to be able to own up to your sin. You've got to be able to say, I, you know what, I believe the lie. I thought the easiest way out was to turn the stones into bread because I didn't want to undergo the physical suffering any longer. I, I believed that. But now once I've done that, I know that that wasn't the way to go. I regret going that way. If no temptation is too much, then any time you give in, faults on you. That helps me to rebuke myself any time I sin. To take responsibility. Not push it aside on circumstances. To not push it aside on other people. Lot was a righteous man in Sodom. He fell into sin after he was out of Sodom. 
Some people say, I'm in a wicked school, you know, I just can't. It's just too hard. This verse says that's not true. It's not too hard. God's faithful. Even if you're in Sodom and Gomorrah, and we're not in near as wicked place yet as Sodom and Gomorrah, and if Lot could be righteous in Sodom and Gomorrah, then we can be righteous in San Antonio, Texas. You can be righteous at San Antonio College. You can be righteous in the workplace. You can take the ways of escape. You can honor God. What promises does this verse teach us? What truths from these things? Well, there's no trial that God is not able to get you through. You know, He can remove it when He wants. He can make it stay longer if He desires. He'll work it to your advantage in the end and for His glory. In James 1.12, it says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast while under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised through those who love him. You want to be that blessed man who takes God at His Word that He always provides a way of escape. This this text also teaches a man can't lose his salvation. If God always provides the way of escape, if God's faithful to do that for the Christian, and some say, well, you could lose your salvation, you can just, you sin so much and then you fall away from grace. Well, the text promises us that God's faithful. He's not going to let us be tempted beyond our ability. So that encourages me, I can't go fall away. Because God always gives me, He always gives me a way of escape. May I not take it all the time? Yeah, I won't. But the Lord promises that. He's going to be faithful to me. The ones who fall away in the time of temptation, they prove they were false. That's why testing, you could say, is bad for the false convert. Because it reveals what they really are. But in a way, that's good. Because if they get revealed they're a false convert, now they can run to the truth. It's better to see what you are and get the cure for it than think you have the cure and you're dying of the terminal illness and you've yet to take the cure. So, let's look at some applications. Some some more applications. I hope there are some in there. Another thing in temptation, don't panic and fall into despair at weird temptations. What do I mean by weird? I personally have had some very weird thoughts try to come in my mind. Weird thoughts. Temptations. Crazy things. And what the devil wants me to do is fall into panic. Fall into despair. You may get tempted with homosexual lust. You may get tempted with who knows what. And then you think, oh no, look how defiling I am. But remember, temptation is not sin. You may sin in the time of temptation. But the temptation in itself is not a sin. The devil showed Christ the kingdoms of the world. He showed Him these things. The devil will try to show you things. But don't fall into despair. There you're being tempted. I could give in. No, there's a way of escape. God's promised that. The devil loves to condemn you. And it's interesting. You're under temptation. Then you start condemning yourself. Why do I feel this temptation? Guess what? Now you're sinning by condemning yourself. Because you're not believing God's love for you. And so now you're sinning. And then now because you've sinned in that way, now it's going to lead you to fall into the very sin that the devil is tempting you to fall into. Satan sometimes suggests blasphemous thoughts. The craziest blasphemous thoughts. Honestly, why panic? I mean, the craziest thoughts. I don't know if any of you guys face it. They'll try to come in my mind while I'm praying while I'm talking to my wife, all sorts of things. And I've learned I'm not going to panic. I'm not going to give place and let that cause me to fall into despair. Because then me falling into despair is going to lead me to fall into the very sin. I mean, the devil, it's like he's tempting me over there, and as I look to that, I trip on the very thing. It's like he camouflaged it. He, he, he didn't want me to look at the rock. He wanted me to look way over there. And then he trips me up, and then I get into that anyways. My point is this. Some people, they're too hard on themselves under temptation. There's a brother in this church. Once I was talking to him, I found out he he thought temptation was sin. Just being tempted meant he was sinning. It's pretty freeing to know when you're tempted, that in itself is not sin. But be careful. Because some people are too loose. And they're tempted all the time and it is their fault. They are subtly giving in to things. And so you've got to be balanced. You've got to be careful. 
I don't want you condemning yourself for being tempted, but I don't want you justifying yourself and saying, oh, this is no big deal. You play with fire, you get burnt. It says in Proverbs 6. Think of Christ. After His temptation ended, did He fall into despair? No, He didn't. So don't despair. Don't beat yourself up. Take the way of escape. But yes, if you give in, do confess it. What should the believer not do in times of temptation? Hebrews 3.8 says, Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing. The day of temptation. Same word there. In the wilderness. Don't harden your heart. One way you can harden your heart again is not believing this verse. That can, that's hardening your heart. Well, there's not really a way out. If you do that, you're hardening your heart. Because you're taking the truth of God's and you're saying, nope, that's not true for me here. You're hardening your heart. Don't do that. Believe God. Don't be faithless in the time of temptation. In 2 Chronicles 28.22, it says in the time of Ahaz's distress, he became yet more faithless to the Lord. You don't want to be the man or the woman who in the time of your distress, it leads you to be more faithless to the Lord. You want to be the one who in the time of the temptation, in the time of the distress, you're the man who remains steadfast when under trial. You're the man who endures. And you think, but I can't do that. That's right, you can't, but God can. He's faithful. He'll help you. Believe His promises. Take Him at His Word. Lastly, the devil doesn't want you to believe that God is always faithful to you. The devil would hate for you to believe that. He's telling you, don't believe that. That's not true. Go ahead and turn to 2 Chronicles 32. It'd help, I think, if you read along. I'm going to read a verse and then I'll look at that one. Hebrews 4.15 For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, because of this high priest, because he's tempted in every respect like we are, because he can relate to us, because he can enter in, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. You hear that? Confidence that we may find mercy and grace to help in the time of need. Well, with that thought and with those words, with confidence, let's look at 2 Chronicles 32. Verse 7. We see Hezekiah, he tell, he's telling Judah this. He says, he's telling the nation, he's telling the people, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or dismayed before the king of Assyria, Sennacherib and all the horde that is with him. For there are more with us than with them. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. Second Chronicles 37, or sorry, 32. Hope I didn't read that wrong earlier. And the people took confidence from the words of Hezekiah. Stop there real quick. The people took confidence from the words. Just like we should take confidence from the words of 1 Corinthians 10.13. Just like we should take confidence from the words in Hebrews 4.15 that Christ can sympathize with me. That He's there with me. That He went through it all already and He never sinned. He got an A+. He never failed. He never cheated on the test. We should take confidence in that. But this is what I want to hit on. We're about to look at here. The devil doesn't want you to take confidence in that. So look what happens. Sennacherib says... What are you trusting that you endure? You hear that word endure? Just like in 1 Corinthians 10. That you endure the siege in Jerusalem? Is not Hezekiah misleading you? That you may give, that he may give you over to die by the famine and by thirst? So here Hezekiah, he tells them truth. They took confidence because of the words. Paul tells us truth. We take confidence because of the words. But then the devil comes right in there. And he says, don't let God mislead you. There's not always a way of escape. But look at verse 15. Do not let Hezekiah deceive you 
or mislead you in this, in this fashion. And do not believe Him. For no God of any nation or kingdom has been able to deliver His people from My hand or from the hand of My fathers. How much less will your God deliver you out of My hand? And then in verse 18, And they shouted it with a loud voice in the language of Judah to the people of Jerusalem who were on the wall to frighten and terrify them in order that they might take the city. So the devil, he wants to frighten you. He wants to terrify you. He wants to say there's no way out. You, you should just give in. You can't get out of this temptation. What did Hezekiah to do? Verse 20. He prayed because of this and cried to heaven. And, let, and the Lord sent an angel who cut off all the mighty warriors and commanders and officers in the camp and the king of Assyria. So he, tur- he returned with shame of face to his own land. And when he came into the house of his God, his false God, some of his own sons struck him down there with the sword. So the Lord saved Hezekiah. And verse 22 says this, He provided for them on every side. I know I just read a lot there. I'm sorry if anyone got lost in that. But what happened? Hezekiah tells his men truth. They take confidence in the truth. Sennacherib comes in, says, don't let him mislead you. Don't let him do that. He's deceiving you. No one's been able to beat us. No single person has been able to live pure without marriage. No one's been able to do this or that. He's telling you that. Whatever it is, apply it to your life. Whatever situation you're facing, he's telling you that. And what did, Sennacherib, or what did Hezekiah do? He cried to God. And God came through. And it says right there, He provided for them on every side. And just like the Lord provided for them on every side, He will provide for you on every side in every temptation. And remember, He's the one who's allowing you to be put on trial. The one who allows you to be put on trial. The one who gives you the test is promising you, I'm going to give you the answers for the test. I'm going to give you a way of escape. There's no temptation that tries to pin you down that's going to be too strong, too out of the ordinary, that you can't endure it, that you can't get out of it. You've got to believe me. That's what Paul's saying. Believe this. Take heart in this. Because if you do that, you can walk in close fellowship with Christ. So flee from idolatry. Flee from loving anything more than the Lord. So don't believe the lie that God is not able to deliver you. In Psalms 21, it says, though they, they, they plan evil against you, though they devise mischief, they will not succeed. If they succeed, it's not because God failed. It's because you didn't trust God. You wanted out of the suffering, you went out of the temptation, and you gave in. Too many people blame their circumstances. Granted, you can put yourself in circumstances of big temptation and fall into it. Well, conclusion. Not only are we promised a way of escape from temptation, we are promised to escape being sentenced to hell through Jesus Christ. Again, think of that. If you're not a Christian here today, not born again, don't think, oh, I need to get out of temptations. That's not your big issue. If you're not a Christian, your big issue is the wrath of God abides over you. And you need that wrath to be removed. And you think, and I better not be tempted, I better get out of this, that's not going to help. You need that wrath removed. And the only way is that Jesus Christ took our sentence on the cross for His people. My sins were put upon Him. He paid the price. He who knew no sin became a sin offering for me so that in Him I can be declared the righteousness of God. I can be brought into right relationship with God. This God who so loves us that He promises there's a way of escape. It says in 1 Thessalonians 5.2 that the lost, they will not escape. They may escape these trials and testings that make the Christian like gold, which are good for the Christian. Like David, Lord, try me. What a bold prayer. They may escape those, but in the end they won't escape hell. Look at Job, all the suffering he went through. A lot of lost, wicked, rich men never had to go through all of that. But they'll have to go through hell. So don't lose heart in your trials and your testings. Let me read the verse one more time. No temptation 
has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. And He will not let you, put your name there, be tempted. He will let you be put on trial. But in the trial, He won't let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, He will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. That doesn't mean get instantly out of it. That means endure. Suffer. There's, it's going to end. Temptation is always going to be here for us on this earth. But when we get to heaven, no more of it. So take heart. Let's pray. Lord, I'm thankful that You're sovereign. Thankful You're on the throne. Thankful no good thing do You withhold from those who walk uprightly. I'm thankful all things work together for our good. I'm thankful You know our steps before we take them. I'm thankful You know the thought life we have. I'm thankful You know our ability. I'm thankful You've made this promise to us, Lord. What a promise. Lord, we don't have to give in to sin. So Lord, help us all the more to give in to You. To be satisfied in You. To partake of You. To drink from You. For You are altogether lovely. Be with us today, Lord. And even today, help us to take the ways of escape. To not give in to whatever temptations may come our way even in these next hours. I ask this in Christ's name. Amen.